Hello everyone, welcome to this week's episode of This Week in British History with me, Philippa Lacey Brule from British History Tours. This week's episode, we're looking at events which happened between the 25th and the 31st of May. And again, loads of interesting stuff happened in this week, so let's get started. <music> If you love history, then you are definitely in the right place. And I'd absolutely love it if you subscribe to my channel. And if you enjoy this video, please feel free to comment below. I love answering to everyone's comments. Give it a thumbs up and let other history lovers know that this is available. If you can't wait the week it will be till the next episode of This Week in British History, then you can come and find me on Facebook or Instagram as well. You can also subscribe to my newsletter, which basically is me sending out the link to this um, video on a weekly basis, so you get it straight to your email inbox. And if you want to do that, then that again is a link in the show notes. This week's episode, we're looking at events which happened between the 25th and the 31st of May. We are looking at three events in particular. The return of Charles II to England, he is a restoration monarch, the restoration king, and he came back on his 30th birthday, a rather unique way of spending your 30th birthday. We also look at a less famous event, possibly one you haven't heard of at all. The Rougely Poisoner gets his sentence in court and it was the beginning of the Peasants' Revolt. In 1381, the biggest up till that point, or possibly ever, uprising of English uh, subjects against the ruling powers. So we've got our three main stories that we're going to cover this week but there's also a couple of other things that I want to mention. 30th of May 1536 and Henry VIII marries Jane Seymour. Now I've covered that in more detail in The Fall of Amber then part four uh, which is on this channel as well but this is just to highlight it his second wife Anne Boleyn was executed on the 16th of May. So Henry spent absolutely no time grieving for his second wife, uh, lamenting her supposed adultery, which um, was fictitious, um, and married his third wife, Jane Seymour. And on a slightly less serious note, but just as important if you're a fellow cereal eater, John Kellogg in 1884, on the 31st of May, patented flaked cereal. Also on the 31st of May in 1859, the clock at the top of the Elizabeth Tower at the Houses of Parliament, sometimes erroneously known as Big Ben, which is actually the bell inside, but the clock was started up. And Big Ben, the bell, was first rung in the July of the same year. So on to our main stories for this week. On the 27th of May 1856, Dr William Palmer, known as the Rougely Poisoner, was convicted of murder by poisoning at a court in Staffordshire. Doctors in the Victorian period were well respected as they are now, but that didn't mean that there weren't those wary of him. Indeed, his own mother-in-law warned her daughter not to marry him. It turned out her concerns were warranted. Only a year after William had married her daughter Anne, she went to stay with them for two weeks. At the end of those two weeks, she was dead. Her name was Mary Thornton and she had a great fortune which her daughter Anne was now going to inherit, or so William thought. However, his plans were frustrated by the fact that the trustees of the estate only drip-fed Anne the money, which was equivalent to something like £1.3 million in today's money. Now, it's not actually known for sure if William had a hand in his mother-in-law's death. She was a known alcoholic and was already very poorly. Perhaps it was just something to do with that. But from his actions in the future, you might start to suspect otherwise. In 1854, William was heavily in debt, but without his wife's inheritance coming to him in one lump sum, he was going to have to find another way of getting some money. William appears to have turned to insurance fraud. He took out an insurance premium on his wife, Anne, for £13,000. After the payment of only one premium, Anne unexpectedly died. 
The following year, he took out an insurance premium on his brother for £14,000 and the same happened again. It's thought that in total Palmer killed 15 people including his wife, brother and mother-in-law. He was finally caught and tried for murder on the 27th of May 1856. His sentence was to be executed by hanging and that was carried out on the 14th of June outside Stafford Prison to which a crowd of 35,000 people turned up to watch, some of whom had camped out overnight to get a good spot. On the 29th of May 1660, Charles II returned to England to become king. It was his 30th birthday, a rather unique way of spending your birthday. England had been without a monarch for 11 years after his father Charles I was executed on the 30th of January 1649. At this time, even though England and Scotland had the same monarch, they were not joint countries and Charles II had actually been recognised as King of Scotland in 1650, but it wasn't until 1660 that he came back as King of England, known as the Restoration King or our Restoration Monarch. Charles, unlike his father and grandfather before him, recognised that to rule with no thought for what people were saying and public feeling was not going to do him any good. His father and grandfather, so Charles I and James I, had totally and utterly believed in the king's right to rule, the divine right to rule. Their word was God's word and to, uh, to uh, disagree with that meant you were disagreeing with God. Charles II had a bit more of a pragmatic approach and this, along with the disgust of the regicide that had happened in 1649, really gave the monarchy quite a good grounding. People just didn't have the stomach for more war. Two big events in London history, at least, that, um, that you will have heard of that occurred in the reign of Charles II. 1665 was the Great Plague, which would have affected um, all the country, but London um, be being such a close-knit um, population, literally people living uh, on top of each other, that it spread um, rapidly. And then in 1666, September 1666, the Great Fire of London, which I will definitely be covering in more detail in, um, in September. Um, I do a walking tour of London and the Great Fire, so it's, um, it's, a, real, it's a real passion of mine. I really enjoy the story. Um, and I will relay it to you in the correct week. <laughs> Charles would be on the throne for just under 25 years, dying at the age of 54 in February 1685. He was succeeded by his brother, James II, and you'll be hearing more about James II in relevant weeks. He is the king whose, uh, whose conversion to Catholicism sparked um, the unrest which would become the, or lead to the glorious Re revolution which brought joint monarchs William and Mary to the throne. I will cover that in more detail in a different video because uh, Glorious Revolution is a very interesting, very important uh, story chapter in, in uh, this island's history. Charles was succeeded by his brother because despite the fact that he had scores of illegitimate children, his wife Catherine of Braganza had unfortunately only given birth to stillborn babies and so he had no legitimate heirs. On 30th of May 1381 saw the beginnings of the Peasants' Revolt. This was in response to a new tax but we need to go a little bit further back to understand how this came about. Earlier on in the century the Black Death had claimed the lives of a third of the population of the country. This meant that the remaining labour force were getting more choice as to where they would work and they could go where they were paid higher wages. This was pushing up their wages and pushing up the costs of the wealthy landowners. So in the end, Parliament decided to put a stop to this free market economy and they put a cap on wages and they also encouraged the landowners to reassert their manorial rights. So tensions were already building when in 1380 a new poll tax was introduced. Now a poll tax means that everyone pays it regardless of their ability to. And this obviously with the fact their wages are being kept down created big dissatisfaction. 
On the throne was the boy king, Richard II. He had become king at the age of 10, and so there was a council who were ruling on his behalf. So the people of the country didn't blame him, they blamed his council. And this would be important when the peasants did revolt because Richard stepped in. The revolt was led by a man called Wat Tyler and the rebels sieged London. They set fire to buildings, they murdered nobles, lawyers, judges, people in senior positions who they had grievances against, whether personally or because of their position. They even stormed the Tower of London, helped by the fact that someone hadn't closed the gates. But they got in and they found Simon Sudbury. Simon Sudbury was the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Chancellor. And when he was discovered in the chapel of St John within the White Tower, he was dragged up to Tower Hill where he was executed on a makeshift block. It took eight blows to sever his head from his body, after which it was paraded around the city of London on a spike. This was a dangerous time. The king was in a very dangerous position. The whole Plantagenet line was hanging in the balance should anything happen to the boy king. Richard was 14 years old at the time and he rode out to meet the rebel leader at Smithfield, which at the time was on the outskirts of the city. The rebel army were gathered there with their leader, Watt Tyler, and Richard and his entourage were vastly outnumbered. Wat Tyler came towards the king, rode towards the king on his horse and reasserted the demands of the rebels for freedom and equality. The king agreed, but a scuffle broke out and in the confusion, Wat Tyler drew his dagger, at which point the mayor of London plunged his sword into Wat Tyler's neck, killing him. He fell off the horse and the rebels drew their weapons ready to avenge his death at which point Richard spurred his horse toward the rebels, proclaiming, I will be your king, your captain and your leader. It was an incredible thing to do and the crowd's mood calmed immediately. Richard also promised a pardon for all the rebels and they began to disperse. Richard, however, did not keep his promises. Thank you for joining me for this episode of This Week in British History. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please do give it a thumbs up. Um, if you want to come and find more daily fixes of history from me, then please come along to my Facebook or Instagram pages. All the links that you will need are in the show notes. But for now, keep safe, keep well, and I will see you all next time.